We are a whiny people. We fetch, we moan. We Jews are very good at recognizing the bad in the world. We know when it's too hot, today. We know when it's too cold, last week. We're so good at it that sometimes we can even predict when things are going to be terrible, and we, in our infinite Jewish wisdom, can complain about something before it has even happened. <laughs> we can predict the terrible future. It seems we're not so good at predicting a positive future. Oh, I'm not going to meet up with my friends because they're going to annoy me. Not going to see the play because it's boring. We, as a people, have very powerful, clairvoyant powers. And there is a long tradition of this for our people going at least as far back as the ancient Israelites. Again and again, as we wandered through the desert, we complained there wasn't enough water, there wasn't enough food, and we're going to die. <laughs> Things were better when we were slaves in Egypt. We're a kvetchy people. This kvetchiness, I think, is also one of our strong suits. It maybe is one of the reasons we've been so historically involved in movements for justice. We see the bad, we kvetch about it, and sometimes we actually do something about it to make it better. We organize, we march, we lobby, we protest. It's all good. Seeing the bad is an important part of Jewish life. At this point in our Torah cycle, we're most of the way through the book of Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. So having, having been with us through most of our desert fetching already, God is well accustomed to this endearing quality of ours. God knows that whatever God gives us, we're going to whine. Which is why in this Parsha, God knows us well enough to preemptively deal with our complaints. This week, we deal with the laws of Shemitah, the sabbatical year, and Yovel, the jubilee year, letting us know when they happen, how to count the years and declare them, as well as how we are not supposed to plant or harvest food during the sabbatical year. We are to let the land, the people, and the animals rest. Sounds pretty great. A year of rest, no work, no planting. A sabbatical every seven years sounds pretty good to me. Until you consider the ancient Israelites did not have access to canned tuna or frozen Trader Joe's meals. They didn't get to order dinner off of Seamless. And as a people primarily dependent on the regular agricultural cycle, the idea of not planting and harvest, harvesting is actually a really scary one. And for a people such as us, obviously we're going to complain about it. God knows this. God gets this. God has seen this before with us. Before we can even complain about how terrible the Shemitah year is going to be, how we have to eat dried fruit all the time and nuts and it's going to be terrible, God says to the Israelites with full anticipatory wisdom, when you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Behold, we won't plant and we won't harvest our produce. God's anticipating this. He knows, he knows us pretty well. There's not going to be enough food. Sound Jewishly familiar? <laughs> but God not only anticipates our complaint before we've said it, but also gives a compassionate solution. God says, then I will command my blessing for you in the sixth year, and it will yield produce for three years. Basically, what God says is, relax. There's going to be enough, no need to worry. One of the things I love about this verse that my chavruta, Michael Weiss, pointed out is the nature of the divine human partnership inherently required in this abundance. God does not say, if you work hard enough and store your food proper properly, you will have enough to eat. This is not solely a human endeavor. Nor does God say, as God does elsewhere, I will make food magically come down for you to eat and you will have enough. This is not purely a divine endeavor. Rather, God recognizes our fear, God meets us with love, and asks us to be in partnership. We plant seeds at the appropriate time. God will make sure what they produce is enough for a few years. It takes our handiwork and God's blessing to yield abundance. 
Now I want to take a brief theological interlude here. For many of us in the room, the idea that there is a supernatural God that helps crops grow in exorbitant amounts, or even a God at all, might be troubling, foreign, alienating. Taking a cue from God's book, I hear your complaint before you verbalize it. <laughs> so when you say, but I don't believe in a supernatural God that makes crops grow, I will say, I'm not sure I do either. But there is something to be said for the Hebrew word ki'ilu. When the medieval Kabbalists made a theological statement that was perhaps a little too far-fetched even for them, they would insert the word ki'ilu, meaning as if. It is ki'ilu, as if the trees were talking, they say in one drash. They won't go so far as to say the trees were talking, just ki'ilu, as if the trees were talking. Now, I don't mean to say that in times of material need or threat or deprivation, if we work hard enough ahead of time, God will definitely command God's blessing and everything will be great and abundant for us. It's not that simple. It's not how it works. There has been and continues to be significant lack for many people in the world and probably even in this room tonight. But rather, I'm inviting us to step into the imaginative word, the imaginative world of the word ki'ilu, the words of as if. What would it mean to live ki'ilu? God will provide for us in the way that God commits to during the sabbatical year. What would it mean to live ki'ilu? God anticipated our complaints and had a compassionate and proactive solution for them. What would it mean to live ki'ilu? God needed us as much as we needed God to get our needs met. This is not God as omnipotent father figure on the throne, but rather God as partner, God as friend, God as sibling, co-creating abundance. Could we live ki'ilu this were true? Can we imagine living into a world that is better, more generous, more kind, more whole, than maybe it actually is? Can we be open to the shocking possibility that maybe the world is secretly better than we think it is? I want to share a brief story from the Talmud that I'm sure some of you have heard before. A man named Choni was walking and encountered another man who was planting a carob tree. Choni asked him, how long do you think it takes for this tree to bear fruit? His reply, 70 years. Choni, noticing this was a grown man around the year 200 CE when lifespans were not so great, said, are you sure you're going to be around to taste the fruit? The man replied, I found ready grown carob trees in the world. As my ancestors planted these for me, so too I plant these for, children, for the, my children. Abundance. When there could be nothing, when we have the choice to ensure abundance or lack, we may choose abundance, even when we may not directly experience it. As Rabbi Kleinbaum said, this is my last time on the Bema as an official Cooperberg Rittmaster rabbinical intern that I will be here for the summer. Um, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge the abundance that has been, for me, CBST. As a closeted queer kid growing up in the suburbs, I never imagined I would one day be in rabbinical school, let alone interning at the world's largest LGBTQ synagogue. With divine blessing and human hands, this place came into, came into being and has offered me, and I know so many of us, abundance. Not perfection, but abundance. I came into this world with CBST already here. CBST is older than I am. <laughs> and I'm, great, I'm so grateful for that fact, because I came into this world with an abundance of carob trees that, while present, were unknown to me for most of my life. I complained before knowing about CBST. I've complained since knowing about CBST. <laughs> and I've seen injustice, and I've critiqued it, and this has been important. And 
I never would have believed that such a place could exist and that one day I'd be sharing words of Torah in CBST's own building from the Bema. Unfathomable. Truly unfathomable. For this blessing that God has commanded, I want to say thank you. Thank you to the founders and the builders and the visioners and the schleppers and even the kvetchers for coming together in the face of scarcity, for working hard, and for being open to God's sacred blessing of abundance. For the trees that feed us and for those that plant them, for the homes that shelter us and for those who build them, we give thanks. May God continue to grant us blessings in the hardened face of complaint, in the knotted stomach of scarcity, and in the closed eyes of doubt. May we all soften, open, and imagine into the world where through our efforts and God's, our needs will be met with abundance. Ki'ilu.